weather, our gardening weather. And uh, we need to be reminded that we do live in Texas and we can see all four seasons in 30 minutes. So <laughs> either that or Amarillo left their door open again. <laughs> <clears throat> we are continuing our study in Revelation. We're going to be looking at chapter 15 today. And uh, before we get started, uh, let's have a prayer. Are there any special requests that's not mentioned in the bulletin that we need to, to bring before the throne of God? Okay. Yes, I'm fixing to. Oh, here. I'll let you have that right now. Thank you. Well, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we are so thankful to you for the blessings you give us. And Father, we know that the blessings came at a great cost to you. We ask you, Father, to help us to glorify you in all we do. And Father, we ask you to be with us this morning as once again we are reminded of not only what our brothers and sisters in the early church had to deal with, but Father, we also must be reminded that you had more power than any throne in this world. And Father, you are above all, you see all, and Father, we thank you for that. We ask you, Father, to help us to become more like your Son as we continue to study your Word. We pray in Christ's name, amen. I want to begin by asking a question, have you ever been stressed out? <laughs> that looks kind of like my desk, and that's after I straightened it up. When people are stressed out, one of the things that happens, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, if you get stressed out, it is easy to lose our ability to focus. Because stress takes our focus somewhere else. Now, whether we as Christians are stressed out about a nation or whether we're stressed out about a government or anything else in this world, in this country, and in this state, brethren, let me tell you, the things we do get stressed out about, I do not believe can be compared to the things that stressed out the early church during the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. Those people, our brothers and sisters in Christ, were harassed and they were persecuted by a government. They were used by a government to try to end what they were doing. They were martyred by their own government. And that same government that God ordains all governments to do, and that is to protect her citizens... And that's what God has ordained governments to do. You read that in Romans chapter 13. Instead, Rome, because she was being used, she was being used to go after a people who believed in one God instead of the emperor as God. So instead of protecting the rights of her citizens, who happened to be members of the church, because they worshiped the one and true God, I'm wondering if at times they felt stressed. I'm wondering if they ever felt stressed out. You see, and I, I need to remind us every week, this is the background to Revelation. Revelation. And when we get to chapter 15, we're going to see again how God's going to reveal to them their future that lay before them and deal with their stress and deal with the fact that don't allow what's happening right now 
to stress you out to the point to where you no longer have the assurance of your salvation and the home that God has prepared for you. And in this chapter, what God is going to do, He is going to remind His people of something that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 we read, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. Now brethren, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about you, but it's the things I see that stress me out. And yet Paul comes along and he says, don't fix your eyes on the the seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, is that still a good message for the church today? Now, I don't know about you, have you ever watched the news, or have you watched the news lately, and do you get stressed out by that? I've got to tell you, uh, I've kind of just gotten to the point where I have just tuned out all the news. Now, that may be a bad thing, because maybe being ignorant of everything going on that I don't really want to deal with may not be good. But I'm also reminded of something else. In Philippians, Paul tells us to think on good things. And I've noticed that when bad things happen and I start looking at those and questioning, and it's not that I don't know that there's bad things happening. I know there are. You can't avoid that. But brethren, what I have noticed is when I start focusing on that, I start losing focus on the eternal. And this is what Revelation 15 is going to help us. Because in Revelation chapter 15, we're going to see seven angels and seven bowls of wrath. The wrath of God being poured out on the world. Now, let me set the stage for this. We have seen over and over and over again where God is saying, this is going to happen, but don't let it stress you because I'm still king, I'm still in charge, I'm still on the throne. That's been the message so far. As a matter of fact, it seems like every week I'm teaching the same lesson as we go through Revelation. Have you noticed that? I hope you're not getting bored with it because I'm running out of different ways to try to say the same thing. And that's exactly what Revelation does. Over and over and over again, he is saying the same thing. Don't lose your focus. God is aware of everything that happens to you. Don't lose your focus. But now chapter 15, he says, now I'm going to tell you how I'm going to deal with all this evil that you're surrounded by that is coming from your own government. I'm going to tell you how I'm going to deal with the evil that comes at you from different directions. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And so we get to chapter 15. He is simply saying, people who go after the church will not go unpunished. They don't escape God's attention. And so what he does, he talks about some angels. We're introduced to these angels uh, in, in the first couple of verses of chapter 15. And what he's going to tell them is that for rebellious people, a time for mercy will end. Now, let's look at verse 1. Uh, read verse 1 with me. I don't have it on the screen, but read, read. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. There's going to come a time in every nation and in every individual when God's time of mercy will come to an end. Now, when he talks about the plagues, what does that word remind you of? Have we ever read of plagues before in the Bible? Remember the time of Pharaoh 
and the Moses and God's oppressed people. Now, you know what those plagues were really about? Those plagues was from God, from heaven himself, from God himself. That was a 10-lesson correspondence course from heaven for God to tell Pharaoh who's really running the universe. Now, remember the name Pharaoh. Right in the middle of the word Pharaoh is the R-A, Ra, the God they worship, the sun god. And Pharaoh in Egyptian is basically the son of the sun god. That's why the Pharaohs were referred to as gods. Okay, with all that in mind, what did the ten plagues do? Reminded Pharaoh, you're not in charge. Now, was there a time, was there a time when Pharaoh thought he was? Mm -hmm. Have there been people from the time of Pharaoh that paraded around and acted like they were in charge? Yes. And where are they? They're no more. Are there people today thinking, parading around as if the universe is all about them? Yes. What's going to happen eventually? The same thing that happened to everyone else. You see, the imagery is this. It is here to remind the early church that God, just as God vindicated and freed his people from an oppressive government, an oppressive world system back under Moses, he will do it again. But only this time, it is going to be far worse than all of the people who ever oppressed God's people. The only difference here is that the Israelites could look back, they could look back in their history and they could see what God had been doing. But God's people today also can look back in history and see what God did. Now here's the point. Every time somebody questioned God or questioned Jesus about God, what was usually the response? In the book of Hebrews, when people were starting to struggle with their faith and question, is following Jesus worth it? We get to chapter 11. What does the writer do? He goes back and he says, real simple, look at God's track record. When has God ever failed his people? When has God ever broken a promise? Now, we understand that today real easy. When you go in to open credit or open up a credit card or an account, what do they do? What do they check? Your history. Why do they do that? Can they just not take your word? Well, your history says something about your character. And when the writers of the Bible said, look at God, look at the history, look what he has done in the past, in other words, check his credit record. Check his character. You can trust him. And so these ten plagues are nothing more than God doing again what he has done in the past. Only this time, he's talking about what he is going to do to our oppressors. And so, we see where God is introducing something. It's called his wisdom. Actions have consequences. And you can't escape them. Secondly, he's talking about the preparation for the day of wrath. We read in verses 5 through 8, 
After this, I looked up and I saw in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was open. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and were wore sashes around their chest. Then one of the four living uh, creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God. Now, first of all, let's stop and think, what does seven indicate? God's perfection, God. God himself doing his plan to perfection. There's going to come a day when the wrath of God is going to come upon all of those who did not say Jesus is Lord. And those who came against the church. And believe me, this is going to be his full wrath. Brethren, we haven't seen the full wrath of God exposed yet. We saw the wrath of God against sin at the cross. But brethren, we haven't seen the wrath of God yet. And when it comes, and this is God's promise to the early church and to the church today, don't get your eyes off of what's important by looking at what is in, uh, not important because what's not important that is now trying to destroy you, I will deal with. And he's going to do it and do it completely. It is not going to be something that, brethren, we want to see or be a part of. But that day is coming. And so he continues on. Who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Brethren, this is a scene of what looks like the temple of God that God commanded Moses. Actually, the tabernacle. But now this tabernacle is in heaven. Now, what did the tabernacle represent? You remember the most holy room? It represented heaven. And coming out of heaven is where this wrath of God is going to come from. And so it is here that God not only, not only receives the praise from his people, not only does he receive the worship from his people, from all creation, and from all the saints as well, this is where the wrath of God will eventually come from when it comes time of judgment. And if you remember in the tabernacle, the holy room or the most holy room represented where God lives. It was in that room where we had the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the, 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 ten, the ten Commandments, the table of the commandments were kept in the Ark. And those tablets bore witness to God's accomplishment and his demands, and his unrentless, relentless justice. And the angels coming from this holy place emphasizes they are coming from where? The very presence of who? God. So when this wrath comes upon the world and comes upon evil, according to verse 7, one of the four living creatures and possibly one of the archangels was handed each one of them a bowl of God's wrath. So it's very possible it was one of the archangels that handed this bowl to each of the seven angels. Think of it this way. This, this is how I kind of vision this thing. The, pres the President of the United States calls for a meeting of all of his top aides and cabinet members along with the generals of the military, armed forces. World tensions are very high. The America, America has been attacked. And when these people leave the meeting, their faces are grim. And you know something is about to happen. That's what this is a picture of. When it comes time for God's wrath, this is going to be a meeting. And the impact of this message to the early church was real simple. God will 
bring his wrath against any people, person, or nation that does not respect his people. Because the church of Jesus Christ is what? One of the words for the church is the bride of Christ. You can pick on me, but you better not pick on my bride. You can say what you want to about me all day long. Don't you dare. Don't you dare say anything negative about my bride. You get the picture? And God is going to deal with those who disrespect his bride. Church, let me tell you something. We need to be very careful how we speak about the bride of Christ. Now, are are we as the bride of Christ perfect? No. Now, I think differently in my case that my bride is perfect but every now and then she'll tell me she's not but I don't listen to her when she says that matter of fact a couple of times she'll say something like that and I'll say remember sweetheart you're talking about my wife and she's sitting out there she can tell you brethren let me tell you something the church had been the target of their own government They have been under siege by Satan. The enemies of God's people seem sometimes to have gained the upper hand. And this is a picture of God calling his angels together, having a meeting, and he's handed them some weapons and said, now go take care of them. Now, I'm going to tell you why Rome fell. Because of this meeting that's recorded in the 15th chapter of Revelation. That's why Rome fell. But there's coming a time when all, all, all will fail. And they're going to experience a whole lot more wrath than was ever brought against Rome. And the message is simple. God will give every one of his enemies time to surrender. But there will come a time when it will be too late. The reason God held back his judgment on Rome and allowed this to go on as long as it did was to give the enemies of God time to repent. Do you know what the will of God is? The will of God is that no one perish. That's the will of God. But not everybody, not everybody desires that the will of God be done. And there will come a time. So how do we deal with our enemies? Well, real simple. In Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19. Do not repay evil, uh, do not repay anyone evil for evil but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone for if it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone do not take revenge my dear friends but leave room for God's wrath for it is written it is mine to avenge I will repay says the Lord the Lord is reminding the church don't you try Don't you try to repay your enemies for what they're doing to you. This is God telling the early church and telling us today and telling the church of every generation, he's going to keep his word. So in this scene, John is telling us that in every generation, a time of mercy will pass and the day of opportunity will eventually disappear And when that happens, nothing, nothing will keep the wrath of God from coming up against a people or a nation that has finally gone too far. And remember, it is God's decision when it happens, and it's God's decision on how it will happen. So how do we do it? We do what we're told in Romans. 
We pray for our enemies, and we do not repay evil for evil. Remember also Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He's talking about a nation. He's talking about a people who decided they no longer needed God. And here's how it ends. The wrath of God is, present tense, not was, not will be, is. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what be, may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have, clearly, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Here it is. Whether you realize it or not, we witness God's wrath every day. Notice he said, God's wrath is being revealed. Well, what is this wrath? Actions have consequences. I have never met a person who is going against the will of God, who is completely happy and totally self-fulfilled. They're always angry about something. That's the wrath of God working against them. I have never had a straight person come to my office and say, Jack, can you help me? I'm straight. But I've had several homosexuals come to my office and say, Jack, I need help. That was the wrath of God working against them. You see, when you work against God's will, you're not going to be fulfilled. You can't be. And what you're experiencing, that emptiness, that longing, that wanting to be something that you never can be, it will not happen until you surrender to God. And so we see, as a matter of fact, we see people today who think the way we solve all the problems in the world is through cleaning up the environment. I got news for you. If you clean up the environment, they're going to find something else to gripe about. And when we get that fixed, they're going to be unhappy. They're never happy. They're always looking for happiness by people changing the way they do things to make them happy. And brethren, as long as my happiness depends on how you behave, I'll never be happy. That's the wrath of God. And he's trying to get your attention. And the harder you kick back, the more wrath you're going to build up for yourself. Until the time comes when you finally figure it out, this was what was happening with Rome. Why was Rome going after Christians? Because they weren't happy with the way they were acting. They weren't happy with what they believed. So if we'll wipe out Christians, we'll be happy. Well, good luck with that. Good luck. God is telling the church that even with that, when Rome has run its course, there will be a time for God's wrath. And some might say, wait a minute. God is a God of love. God is a God of patience. God is a God of kindness. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. Yes, and he is also a God of wrath. Don't ever forget that. He is also a God who keeps his promise. Look with me in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, I will, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Brethren, who are God's children to, or who are Abraham's children today to answer that question let's let the Bible do it in Galatians chapter 3 26 to 29 in Christ Jesus you are all children of of God through faith for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free nor is there male or female for you are all one in Christ if you belong to Christ then you are who? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, what promise did God make to Abraham? 
people pick on my kids, I get even. That's it. He made that promise. They be nice to you, I'll be nice to them. They pick on you, they're picking on me. Now, I quite question, how many times has God got to say that before we start believing it? And how many times do we have to read it before we start believing it? So what's the message? Brethren, here's the message. No nation, no people, no language, no tongue is ever going to escape the wrath of God if they insist on persecuting the seed of Abraham. That's the promise God has made. This chapter is a prologue of chapter 16 when God's bowls of wrath are poured out on Rome. But it's also a promise to all nations. When you're dealing with God's kids, you better be careful. You know, it should be abundantly clear now that Revelation was not written to inform the early church that Iran, Iraq, modern Israel, and all the Arabs, and all this other stuff was going to form a European common market that was going to fall apart and the world's going to have trouble from the Middle East. That's not what Revelation was about. Had nothing to do with that because if all this was going to happen 2,000 years down the road, why did Jesus say that if you read it and understand it, you'll be comforted to the people who were reading it and needing comfort. They, were needed, they needed reminding. It was written to comfort and to strengthen the children of God in times of crisis. And they needed to hear three truths that chapter 15 gives them. And what are these three truths? Number one, God has a plan. He always has had a plan. At any given time in history, God's people need to remember this. God has a plan. I have seen the church survive some very incredible raging attacks. I have seen the church survive from all kinds of attacks from Satan and people that he uses. And guess what? The church is still here, aren't we? We're still here. Now, how do you explain that? How do you explain where some of the most powerful governments in the world, and by the way, during the time of Rome, that was the most powerful government in the world, and she had the largest and the best and the best trained and the best armed army in the world, and they could not wipe out the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Duh. God made a promise. He will be patient with them for a while, but there will come a time when that patience will come to an end. In other words, chapter 15 is going to be repeated in history every generation until Christ returns. Because in every generation, there's always going to be a people or a nation or a ruler or somebody who's going to try to wipe out the church. And what we need to be reminded in every generation also is the wrath of God that will put an end to it. As we look back in history, we see nation after nation drift, to pow- drift go into power. But what do they do? They eventually drift away in the sands of time. But where is God's people? Where's God's church? Okay, I'm going to say it. I see the puny, puny, puny attempts of the Muslim nations rising up against God's people. Now, I'm going to tell you what they're doing. They're only constructing the devices of their own judgment and God's wrath to come against them. Now, God can still use them. 
And he can use them to get our attention, to get us back on track. But brethren, all they're doing is constructing the devices for their own execution when they come after God's people. I even see it in our own country. By the way, I don't recognize my country anymore. What I see, you see, the country I grew up in didn't hate Christians. But I see now an ever-increasing hatred of people who claim to know the things of God and serve God. I see where there is no fear of God anymore in our land. And I'm talking about respect. I, I don't see that. I see no repentance So my question is, does God have a plan to use his wrath against those who are doing that? Yes, he does. I don't know how he's going to do it. My responsibility is to pray for my enemies and love them and not pay back evil for evil. God has a plan because eventually, brethren, only there will only be one group of people left standing, and it's going to be God's people. Secondly, God has the power to work out his plan. So he not only has a plan, he's got the power to work it out. Brethren, when it seems that all the power is in the hands of the wicked, isn't it easy to get our eyes off the important thing? It is easy to lose focus and think that God uh, is powerless. But brethren, God has not abandon his throne he has given power to the evil one to work on this earth we know that but he has not given him the ultimate power to work in this world and there are times in history that God may be telling his archangels I want you to come and I'm going to gather you around and I want you to start pouring out my wrath on this nation or these people but even that wrath is going to be limited because his full wrath will be shown at judgment. And so he is going to use his power to work his plan out. And the message for the church today should be the same message as it was for the church back then. And that is this. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Listen to our brother in Christ. He was a shepherd in the church. His name, he, 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 was, a, he was a man who was about to be burned. And he, as a matter of fact, he was burned. His name was Polycarp. He was an elder in the church at Smyrna. Smyrna is one of the seven churches Revelation was written to. Polycarp was a disciple of John. John taught and baptized Polycarp. Later, Polycarp became an elder in the church at Smyrna, and it's interesting, Smyrna is only one of two churches Christ had no condition or no condemnation for. After Revelation was written, about 12 to 15 years later, Polycarp was arrested. He was taken to the arena in Smyrna, and they put him in on a fire, they put him uh, all the wood, stacked all the wood around him and stuck him to a pole. And here is his last words. You threaten me with a mere fire that burns for an hour and then goes out. Haven't you heard of the fire of coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly? Why do you keep delaying? Do whatever you want to with me. That's from the Ananiasine Fathers, Volume 1, page 41. We need to remember that when a nation or a people turn against God's people, God will avenge us. He will avenge us. Let, let God do His work. He has the power to do it. And eventually, He is going to unleash all of His wrath against all of His enemies. And thirdly, Remember this, God is working out his plan. At times it may seem like God is not concerned. 
especially at times when we see all the evil that looks like it's winning. I want to tell you something. That's just a mirage. When it looks like evil is winning, that's just a mirage because he is still in his holy temple. He is aware of what's going on. He is aware of what his people are suffering. And he has always been working out his plan. From the very beginning of time, Satan has been trying to scheme and in his cunning work to avert the people of God. But I want to ask you, has he succeeded? Well, let me ask you a question. Did he succeed when he tempted Eve? Did he succeed when Cain killed his brother Abel? Did he succeed at the Tower of Babel? Did he succeed when the sin that brought about the flood? Did Satan succeed in using Pharaoh to try to wipe out God's people? Did Herod succeed when he tried to make sure Jesus didn't survive by killing all the babies that were two years old and, and are uh, under all the male babies? Did he even succeed at the cross? To me, the only time Satan has had any success is we, he has convinced Christians that God didn't know what he was doing or that God didn't care what was going on or that God was powerless to stop evil. You see, that's when Satan succeeds in the life of a Christian. In chapters 14 and chapters 15 of Revelation, being written to the early church, was to counter the lies that when you look around and when you look at what is seen rather than what is unseen, you're going to start getting your eyes off the throne. And Revelation was written to say, keep your eyes on Jesus. So what do we need to focus on? We need to focus on God And focus less on what we cannot do and more on what we know God can do. You see, God, God can save everyone if they will just let him. Satan can use anyone if they just let him. So Revelation really is a very simple book with a very simple message. Satan has challenged God. God has answered the challenge with a cross. Therefore, Satan loses, God wins. Now you have a choice. Choose sides and be wise with your choice. That's it. Oh, I summed up the whole book right there. What are we going to study next week? Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. I hope this is being encouraging for you.